Welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark, and I'm so excited that you decided to connect today. Right now, grab something to take notes with as we begin today's message. Hey, 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 good morning. Next Sunday, Rush Day, let me encourage you, do not sit on your talents. Don't sit on your talents. When you sit on your talent and don't do anything with it, it's by your stinky parts. Don't be stinky with your talents. Use your talents and abilities for the kingdom of God and his advancement. Next Sunday, um, our teams will be out in the, the circle out there with some tents, and you can kind of shop around, check out. I know that our worship team um, seems really good at what they do, and some people are like, I don't know that I could sing like that. We need singers. We need band members. So please do not feel intimidated to be part of what we're doing here today. Amen? This will be the last week of our series on a journey through Genesis. Next week we're starting a series called The Lost Parables. And it's not us going to other books and looking up stories that Jesus said that are not in the Bible. It's the actual stories of the lost son, the lost coin, the lost sheep. And we're going to dissect those parables and see what they mean to us. And then on Mother's Day, my wife and I will be tag teaming for a Mother's Day special. So you do not want to miss this month. It's going to be really great. So let's jump right in. One of the most heart-wrenching words in the English language that can be said to you is the word no. No. And ironically, it's one of the first words we teach our kids. No. No. Don't touch that. No, you can't do that. And, you know, it's, it's funny. I, I mean, I know that we're well-meaning when we're teaching our kids and that kind of stuff. But, like, we're literally programming our kids to be okay with being told no. No to their dreams. No to the things that they want to do. No to the things that they desire. My wife is, is Hispanic. She's Puerto Rican. Puerto Rico is in the house. And, and something I've learned about her family specifically is that they're like kind of given to fear. Get down from that. You're going to fall and break your neck. Come on. Anybody else raised that way? You know that kind of thing? Yeah. Like it's two steps, but they're going to fall and break their neck falling off of two steps. And, you know, sometimes when we raise our kids, we steal from them their creativity and their conquering spirit. You know, like your kid turns the couch upside down and is climbing up on top of it and they're conquering the couch. Like, no! Get down from that. You're going to break your neck. Like, no, I'm climbing a mountain. This word no. This word no. You're, you're up for a promotion at work. And you go and you put your resume. You're going after it. And your boss says, no, not you. We're going with somebody else. And then you're overqualified for the position, right? Right? This word no. And there's, there's a proverb in the Bible, Proverbs 13, 12, and it says this. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. It's like that thing that you keep chasing after, but it feels like door after door keeps closing. And then eventually you're just like, well, I'm just going to give up. I'm obviously never going to get there. I'm obviously never going to make it. Obviously my dreams aren't going to come true because hope deferred makes the heart sick. I'm just going to quit. I'm just going to give up. Imagine this. You're 11 years old. It's summertime. The Little League baseball team is starting to practice, and you go to your dad. You're like, Daddy, I want to play baseball this year. Now, I played Little League baseball. We're actually, right here in town of Walk Hill. Anybody else in town of Walk Hill Little League baseball? Yeah. I sucked. I just had no business playing Little League. I should not have been in Little League, but my, it was my dad's dream for me to be an all-star second baseman, right? Because he was a second baseman. It's like, nah, man. So I don't remember how old I was, but I was playing for a team called Joy Mufflers. <laughs> Joy Mufflers baseball team. And, man, I was on second base. I had the whole outfit, the whole nine. And I was, like, into it for a little bit until this satanic thing happened called a ground ball. <laughs> Anybody ever try to catch a ground ball coming at you like 200 miles an hour? Okay, now a pop fly is one of those things, it's kind of easy, you just judge it, bam, make the play. 
but a ground ball, you don't know what that thing's going to do. Right? They hit it. It hits the dirt. It's coming at you. You're supposed to come down one knee. You know, capture it like this. Block it. Knock it down with your chest. That ball hit a bump and hit me right in the throat. My career was over. Not because it knocked me out, not because it messed up my throat, but now I'm afraid of the ball. I'm afraid of the ball. So anytime it was hurt, I was trying to do like, you know, anything to protect my throat, right? So you're 11 years old. Dad, I want to join baseball. He gets you a nice glove. You oil that thing up. You're in the backyard tossing the ball back and forth. Your dad's pitching. You're catching. You're hitting. But there's too many kids have tried out for the team, and there needs to be cuts. Right? Anybody gone through cuts? Sucks. Especially when you're excited. Like, yeah, I know I got second baseman. Walk up to the fence where the coach puts it, and your name's not on the roster. In fact, you didn't even make the backup squad. You didn't make the bench. You didn't make it at all. And what are you being told? No, not you. No, not you. Maybe you dreamt your whole life since you were young that you were going to be married. Young. My whole family got married young, right? 19 was like the age that you know, all the older adults got married. I got married at... 20 something, 22. I got married at 22. It's like that thing, like you got this dream, gonna get married young and find the right person. And you're dating and you believe you're in love and man, you got it all planned out. You get down on one knee, you say, will you marry me? And she says, no. <laughs> it's not you, it's me. I'm not ready. I'm not the person yet that I want to be before I settle down in marriage, right? Really what they're saying is, no, it's not me at all. It is you. And I don't trust that you're ready to be my husband and take care of me. Come on, somebody. But that word no, I mean, it's devastating. It's devastating. It's a nasty word. Or perhaps you're in your mid-40s. You take stock of your life and you decide to stay at the job that you're at because it's your best shot to get promotion and move up the chain and move up the ladder. You've stayed up late working, coming up with ideas. You put in for that promotion. No, not you. Door after door closes in your face. Not you. And for some of us, it seems in our lives that we've been locked out, excluded, unwelcomed, opportunities disallowed, and our dreams left in ashes. Many of us have forsaken dreams that we had when we were younger because of consistent closed doors. People saying no. Back in 1976, I was not born yet, Jerry Garcia sang a song that captures this feeling. It says this, I was in the right place, but it must have been the wrong time. I was saying the right things, but I must have used the wrong line. I was on the right trip, but I must have used the wrong car. My head is in the right place, but I'm wondering, what's it all good for? What's it good for? Why, why should I even keep trying to be successful? Why should I even try to keep moving my life forward? And Proverbs reminds us, hope deferred makes the heart sick. In Genesis, it kind of gets to this character called Joseph. Joseph is the son of Jacob. We talked about Jacob last week, Jacob wrestling with God. And now he's got a son named Joseph. In fact, he's got 12 sons. Joseph is the youngest of these sons. And Joseph is his favorite son, his favorite child. In fact, he makes his son a coat of many colors. This coat of many colors says and states that he is the heir. He is going to be the heir to his father's assets and his father's wealth. Overstating, you know, overlooking the 11 other brothers before him, the baby is going to be the heir. And so this creates a lot of animosity in Jacob's home. You know, when we look at successful people, it's easy for us to believe that they were overnight successes. Man, this person came out of nowhere. They were an overnight success. 
I'm going to tell you, there's no such thing as an overnight success. It took 20 years for that person to become an overnight success, right? 20 years of behind-the-scenes work that no one else saw before they were discovered or before they had arrived somewhere, unless, of course, you're Justin Bieber. Justin Bieber is pretty much an overnight success when he was like 12 years old, did a couple YouTube videos, was discovered, stories written. But for everybody else, it takes a lot of work and challenges behind the scene. Some people would think, Colonel Sanders, the owner of KFC, the creator of KFC, overnight success. He was bankrupted like, I don't know, six or seven times before he got the proper Colonel's recipe. We don't see that part of the story. Right? And it's so easy for us to get disillusioned in life because we don't think our lives are moving as fast as other people. I think one of the greatest tools of the devil is social media. Now, I'm not knocking social media. I enjoy social media. But I'm just saying it feeds a lot of people's insecurities. Because we're sitting back knowing that our marriage is struggling and our buddy over here keeps going on honeymoons every weekend, right? Pictures of their feet from here by the sand. You know, I've seen those dang pictures. Those annoy me. Like, I don't really care about looking at your crusty toes. Like, man, this person's at the beach every week. What you don't know, it's the same pictures from one vacation that they're posting multiple times over the months. Like, man, must be nice for them to be vacationing in February and I'm sitting here in the cold, right? There's this, there's this inside of us, there's this problem where we compare our behind the scenes to someone else's highlight reel. They're posting all the great pictures. Nobody posts the bad pictures. Nobody posts a picture of them and their wife or them and their husband when they're fighting. No one does that. Oh, we're so in love. But you don't know they've been in marriage counseling for six years because they hated each other. Right? And we compare these things and we get disillusioned, we get dissatisfied with our own lives because they don't match someone else's Instagram. It's easy for us to look at other people's lives who are successful and say, well, you know what? I haven't arrived in my life. And we fall apart and we get stuck on looking at our past mistakes instead of envisioning a future of what could be. We let our past failures and our past mistakes hold us captive in this prison of a lack of vision. So we're looking at this guy named Joseph. Spoiler alert, his story works out great. He ends up becoming a ruler over a nation and he's very successful. But to get there, sucked. It was horrible for him to get there. He's on a journey, a 13-year journey of no after no after no. In Genesis 37, we're told that Joseph is the favored son of Jacob's 12 sons. He loves him so much, he makes him a coat of many colors. But he's the baby, he's the youngest, and so the 11 other brothers literally hate him. At 17 years old, Joseph has this dream, a vision from God. In fact, he has two of them that prophetically announces that one day he will be a ruler and that his family will serve him. Now, Joseph does what a lot of idiot 17-year-olds would do. He goes and brags about it. He goes right to his brothers, yo, I had this crazy dream last night, and I was this, and you guys were bowing down, and I, ah. They're like, really? You need to go tell dad. He goes, dad, I had this dream, blah, 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 and you were bowing down, blah, blah. and his dad's ticked off too. Oh, so I'm going to worship you. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to bow down before you. So now everybody's angry. Let me give you this. Let me tell you this. There are some people that you cannot share your dreams and visions with. Never, ever, ever share a dream or a vision with a hater. Haters hate and are going to be stuck in their crap their whole life because they're negative. Never. The Bible says this, do not cast your pearl before the swine. 
right? Don't bring a dream before a pig. They can't value it. They're going to gobble it. They're going to destroy it, right? So does that mean don't bring your dream to anybody? No. Don't, do not bring your pro before the swine, so let's do it in reverse. Bring your dreams before the kings. Bring your dreams before successful people. People who also have dreams. People who have bigger dreams than you have. You have to sow seeds of your dream into healthy soil. Never tell a loser your dreams. Pastor Mike, are you trying to call people losers? No, but there are some people who are losers. There's some people who just did not do anything with their life and they blame everybody else for why they didn't do it. And if you share your dream with them, they're going to squash it. You're an idiot. Why would you do that? Da, 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 da. And what does that do? It becomes cancerous to your dream. Negative words and negative influence become cancerous to your dreams. God has revealed this dream to Joseph. He should not have shared it. So what do you do when you have this great dream in your heart and you're not surrounded by people who can help you and enhance you and push you forward? You put that dream on the shelf of your heart. You put it on the shelf of your heart. You take that dream, you put it on that mental shelf. I believe this is what God's leading me to do. This is the direction I need to go. I'm going to work on it in silence. No one has to know the dreams that God shared for you. But he brags about it, Genesis 37, 8. He brags to his brothers, his brother said, so you think you're going to be our king, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more. So they already hated him, but now they hate, hate, hate him. Because of his dream and the way he talked about it. It was a true dream. It was real. But the wrong audience. The wrong audience. See, there's something that we lack in America today, and it's this word called discretion. We think everybody should know every dumb thought that goes through our head, a.k.a. posting it on Facebook. Right? People don't need to know all that stuff. There's just some stuff you need to deal with and work on yourself without posting it everywhere. So one day, Jacob, Joseph's father, says, hey, I want you to go check on your brothers. They're in this other land. Basically saying, I want you to go spy on them because I haven't heard anything back. And come back and give me a report. Now watch this. Genesis 37, 18. When Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance. As he approached, they made plans to kill him. Glad that's not my family. Here comes the dreamer, they said. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of these pits. And we'll tell our father that a wild animal has eaten him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. So not only are they haters, but they're dream killers. Dream killers. Be careful of the dream killers in your life. A.K.A. sometimes it's your family. Sometimes it's your parents. I'm just saying. I'm not saying everybody, but I'm just saying sometimes it happens. We need to be very careful of being around dream killers. Joseph is doing everything right. He's following God, and he obeyed his dad to go do what his dad told him to do. God gave him this future for his life, but his brothers say, no, not you. No. God says yes. His own family says no. See, Family dynamics can be very, very tough and challenging. There's a lot of us in therapy because of the families we were raised in, right? Because if the family unit is together, we can conquer anything. It doesn't matter if the world says no to us. As a family, we can do this together because we're bonding together. But when the family is against you, that's devastating. It's like, well, then who is for me? If my blood's not with me, who's for me? So they decide not to kill him. Reuben stands up and he says, no, let's not kill him. Let's just throw him in the pit and walk away. We'll take his coat. Maybe he'll die. 
But then they see this caravan of slave traders coming, and they're like, let's sell them into slavery. So they do. They pick them up out of the pit. They sell them into slavery for 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver or 30 shekels, even in today's money, is 100 bucks. 100 bucks. 30 pieces of silver is what you would pay in slave trade for a crippled slave. A crippled slave. So that's what they're saying his life is worth. You are worthless. You are only as valuable as a crippled slave. He's a handsome guy. He's a hard worker. He's doing what's right. And his family says, nope, your life is only that of a crippled slave. It can be hard in life when someone doesn't value you. When someone doesn't see the value that's within you. It's hard. It's hard to keep working and, and, and trying to dream ahead when someone doesn't see your value. They don't see your true worth or your calling and they close a door and say, no. And you know, he could have accepted his fate. He could have been like a lot of us when a door closes. Well, I don't understand why this door closed on me. And if God was for me, then why is all this happening? And God, why? But he didn't. He never did. He never turned his back on God. He never questioned God. In fact, he actually pressed more into God. He had a vision from God. And I just want to say this to you. It's important to get a vision from God for your life. Because a solid vision will keep you going through emotionally crippling times. A solid vision. I had a conversation with someone a few months ago. They got a diagnosis of cancer. I don't know what to do. It's written on the wall. My days are numbered. I said, okay, so get a vision for your life beyond the days that are numbered. Well, why would I do that? Why would I waste my time? No, no, no. Get a vision, a five-year vision. Get a 10-year vision of things that you need to accomplish in that time. Because now you need to live to get those visions and goals done. Get a solid vision for your life of where it's going. Joseph stays true to God. In Genesis 39, the Lord, watch this, the Lord was with Joseph. Say that with me. The Lord was with Joseph. So the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you through the tough times. The Lord is with you through doors closing in your face. And watch, because the Lord was with him, he succeeded in everything he did. He succeeds so much that the Egyptian master puts him over ruling his household. Potiphar says, you're my right hand man. You're going to do everything for me. You're going to run my household. He's arrived. He's there, right? No. Nope. Remember I said he's a handsome man? Well, Potiphar's wife thought he was hot. She's like, well, Potiphar's bald and fat. Joseph be looking good. So she's like, hey, why don't you come to my bedroom? And he's like, no. Does the right thing. Multiple times, come lay with me. No. So there's one time she gets everybody out the house. It's a whole scandal. She sets this whole thing up. She gets everyone out the house. And she says, Joseph, I need you to come fix something in my room. Comes in. And she's like, today's the day, baby boy. is going down. And he was like, no. And as he begins to flee, she grabs a hold of his clothes and rips them off him. Now she's some trifling woman. She ticked off, right? So now she says, he tried to rape me. Creates this whole story. Because she ain't going to be told no. Check this out. Potiphar was so furious when he heard his wife's story about how Joseph had treated her. He didn't do it. He's innocent. He took Joseph and threw him in prison where the king's prisoners were held, and there he remained. But the Lord was with Joseph in prison, 
and showed Joseph his faithful love. And he made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners and over everything that had happened in the prison. The warden had no more worries because Joseph took care of everything. Every time the enemy closes the door and says no to Joseph and tries to destroy his dreams, God says, I'm going to bless you, son. Keep your heart right. I'm going to bless you, son. Keep your heart right. I'm going to bless you, son. Keep your heart right. See, the Bible says that the things that the devil means for evil, God can use for his glory. God can use you right where you are if your heart is right. Do we believe in God's faithful love? And it's so easy for us. Yes, we do. Many of us believe that in God's faithful love when things are going great. God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. But then crap happens. Why, God? Why are you doing this to me? Well, is he good or is he doing this to you? No, the enemy comes. The Bible says the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But God has come, or Jesus has come, that we might have life and have it more abundantly. It's not God doing those things to you. It's the enemy trying to cripple your dreams. Trying to cripple your dreams. Every time the enemy closes a door and says no, God opens another door and quickly says yes. Joseph, you're still my guy. Don't grow weary in well-doing. It's almost time. It's almost time. The dream's about to happen. But it took 13 years. 13 years of being a slave, an innocent sufferer, did nothing wrong. How many, do, so many of us have given up on God for less. For far less. He's now 30 years old. His whole life he was following this dream that God set before him that he got at 17. He's now 30 years old. And he begins to see the promises fulfilled. F.B. Myers puts our question about what could be happening in Joseph's mind. And if you've ever sat down and maybe like wrote some of your negative thoughts out, here's what he says that Joseph could have said in his mind. Is it any use then being good? Could there be any truth in what my father taught me of good coming to the good and evil to the bad? Is there a God that judges righteously in the earth? When are you gonna do what's right for me, God, right? And then Meyer speaks to us and he says, you who have been misunderstood, you who have sown seeds of holiness and love to reap nothing but disappointment, loss, suffering, and hate, you know something of what Joseph felt in the wretched dungeon hole. He was doing what God called him to do. And everyone around him said no. Jeremiah 17 gives us this hope. It says, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Even when things are going bad, trust in the Lord. Even when I don't understand, trust in the Lord. We need to trust the process. We need to trust that God is working things out. We heard a story of Abraham told by God to sacrifice his son. And Abraham's like, whoa, okay, yeah. And so he's taking his son up the mountain, but he's trusting in God. Do you know what Abraham didn't see? What Abraham didn't see is as he was walking up one side of the mountain, there's a ram walking up the other side. That as Abraham did what God called him, God already sent the provision to be ready when it was time. It was part of the process. It was part of the process of trusting God. This verse says this, those who trust in the Lord, he is like a tree planted by water 
that sends its roots into the stream and does not fear when heat comes. Christians should not be afraid of what's happening in the world. We shouldn't be afraid. This is the whole point that Jesus was trying to teach his disciples. Why are you afraid of the world when you have me? This says this, if you are in Christ, you are planted by the stream of the Holy Spirit and the waters, the refreshing nutrients will come and feed you and protect you. What shall you fear? So what do we do, Pastor? What's the, what's the moral of this story? So Joseph becomes the ruler. At 30 years old, he sits on the throne and he gets another vision that there's gonna be seven years of plentiful harvest and then seven years of famine. And that he is to store up and stockpile for the seven years of harvest to get the, the, the nation through the seven years of famine. The seven years of famine hit, everybody's coming to them for grain. And Joseph's family comes and he sees his brothers. They don't recognize him because it's been 13 years. He even has to excuse himself and he goes into a side and just begins to weep. He's kind of slick. The story is kind of cool if you want to read it. Doesn't tell him. Actually sets him up, puts him in prison. <laughs> he gets him back a little bit. But the dream comes true. His whole family comes and they bow down before him. The dream was real, but it took 13 years to happen. Do not grow weary in well-doing. Do not grow weary. If God gave you a vision, it will come to pass. The Bible says this, though the vision may tarry, wait. Wait for it. It is for an appointed time. God may have given you a vision for something future in your life, but you're just not ready yet. You need a season of preparation. Now, I'm not saying God put Joseph in prison, and I'm not saying God put Joseph in slavery. What I am saying is what the devil did, God used it to prepare him to be a ruling king. Isaiah 40, verse 31 says this, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall soar on wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall run and not be faint. Waiting on the Lord. Now, I believe in proactive waiting. I don't believe in lazy waiting, okay? I'm the guy that if I'm waiting in the car to go on vacation, I'm honking the horn proactively encouraging you to hurry up. But in my own life, what proactive waiting looks like is I'm doing what I can do to move forward in vision, but I'm waiting on the Lord to do what I cannot do in the supernatural. That's being faithful over your calling. Joseph understood that God's ways are not our ways and his timing is not our timing, but God's timing is always perfect. God's timing is always perfect. Joseph is the son of Jacob. Jacob's name is changed to Israel. During this time of famine, Joseph says, Dad, brothers, go home, bring all our family to Egypt. I can care for them. I can protect them. I can feed them here. He brings all of the children of Israel to Egypt. The children of Israel. And they lived so prosperous and so successful that that family grows beyond two million people. Children of Israel living in luxury in Egypt. Unfortunately, there's another no that comes later on when the king dies, a new king comes in, does not know of Joseph. Says there's too many of these Jews, too many of these Egypt, um, children of Israel, we're gonna make them our slaves. Then you got that whole story where Moses has to come and deliver them. But here's what I want you to do. This is my encouragement today. Use wisdom when a door closes. Use wisdom 
when a door closes. Because how you respond to a no determines your next door opening or closing. You're up for promotion and your boss says, nah, not you. I don't understand. I've been working so hard after all I've done for you in here. Guess what? You just close another door. But you say, yes, sir, I understand. Thank you for your time. Yeah, who's going to do that? Are you crazy? Yeah, wise people. Wise people are going to do that. Wise people are going to give honor. Honor is not based upon whether you like somebody or not. Honor is given for the position that someone holds. Respect is one of those things that we earn. But I don't have to respect you to honor you. What does honoring do? Honoring opens the next door where the boss calls you back in and says, wow, I've never had anybody respond to me like that. You're a true leader. Actually, I wanna push you to another division and oversee the whole thing because of your heart and the way that you responded to me. It opens a door. It opens a door. And I know that we can be so negative about that. Here's what I want to ask. You know, I was raised Pentecostal, right? Speaking in tongues. And we believed, we believed being raised that speaking in tongues is the initial evidence that you were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I don't, I don't believe that anymore. I don't believe that anymore. I believe that the initial evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit. Is the fruit of the Spirit. Because I've seen a bunch of tongue-talking people who are the nastiest people you ever want to meet. Don't tell me that's the Holy Ghost. Right? Though I speak in the tongues of angels and of men and have that love, I have nothing. Fruit of the Spirit is love. Love. How you respond to people how we care for one another. Don't tell me that you're some Christian and, and, and you're on your way to heaven, but you're cussing out your neighbor. Come on, somebody. Don't be judging somebody for their political views or their identities. And then you call yourself this person who loves God and loves their neighbor as himself. It's contrary. It's contrary. Come on, somebody. Can you imagine Joseph being that person? He would have died in prison. He would have died in prison if he was the kind of Christian most of the church people are today. Come on, saying it's an inward work. You see, for 13 years, God is doing something inside of Joseph to set him up so that God could do something through Joseph. But the work had to start inside of him. And many times we don't want that process. We don't want God to work in us. We just want him to work through us. No, he got to do the inward work first. He got to set us up. My hope is maybe God is yelling yes to you. And maybe God's opening doors for you. But he still wants to do some work in you. So that he could be, you could be used for his glory and his honor. Sometimes we think God is saying no, and he's simply saying not yet. Wait on the Lord. Those who wait on the Lord, renew their strength, rise up on wings as eagles. Man, that's just, I just think about that. Flying like an eagle, soaring, like if I just put my arms out, I could fly. I used to have dreams of that when I was a kid. It's crazy. God wants to use you. But he wants to do that work within you. He wants, to have, he wants you to have the joy of the Lord. He wants you to be happy. He wants you to be light, not so serious, not so negative. So he can use you on the earth today. Maybe you're watching online or you're in the room and you've never had an opportunity to bring that Holy Spirit into your life. The Bible says that when we call on the name of the Lord to be saved, that God sends another. He sends himself in the form of the Holy Spirit to come and live and abide on the inside of us. That he is our comforter, he is our counselor, he is our guide. We can rely on that. But if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you don't have a relationship with God, it can be very easy 
to try to live a good life in your own ability and fall short over and over and over again. We've got to give that to the Holy Spirit. We've got to give that to God. If you're here today, you're watching online, and you've never had an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, we would love to pray this prayer with you today. Would you repeat after me? Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. My name is Pastor John Mark, and I'm so glad we were able to connect together today. If this impacted you in any way, I need you to do a few things for me. I need you to like and subscribe to this channel and head over to FamilyChurchNY.com to take your next steps.